Um, so uh, you're at Open Source Gallery, and this is How to Little Fire. We are in season eight. We have changed our format to uh, one storyteller at 45 minutes um, from four storytellers. Uh, all the other seasons had co-hosts. This year, I took back up the um, hosting responsibilities, and it's been amazing so far. My friend Jen Fitzgerald is going to be telling a story tonight. I'm really excited to hear that. But first off, I would love to introduce you to Monica, who is the director of Open Source Gallery, and she is going to talk to you a little about what's happening next month and a little bit about the gallery itself. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so Open Source Gallery right now, we are still um, in the show with Zoe and Shin, Shin and Anthony Bordlovich. Uh, there's tons of hands that um, kind of tell their stories that they've worked through through, uh, through the pandemic. And um, there's also another um, kind of option that that um, is participatory that is within the show. How to build a fire, fire happens every month, no, regardless of what show we are having here. Um, February, <laughs> and it's funded by the Public Foundation. Thank you so much. I know um, it's really a great help. Uh, then the next, uh, the next show we have coming up is Petrina and G. Um, she's coming from Toronto, and there is going to be. Um, Mahjong instructions on weekends, Sunday, Sunday afternoons. Um, we have always a different instructor. We we'll look them up on the internet, uh, on the, on the internet um, on the website and Instagram. Um, there's also other options to play Mahjong and to see the show. Um, we have a Church of Monica scheduled next month and another How to Build a Fire coming up. What's your website? OpenSourceGallery.org. So I told the storytellers this year that because we only have one storyteller, it sucks to go on cold. So I would do an icebreaker five minute story. Um, again, I apologize that this is not the same energy level as I usually have, but this, I think this is the 5,000th time I've told this story. So if there were emojis, there'd be balloons. Um, but because they're, maybe you guys can put up emojis around, crown me in emojis. Um, but this is back when I was still preaching the gospel. Um, and I was, I had a congregation of, not stadium sized congregation, but um, about um, below 70,000, but above 20,000 people that were in the congregation. I told Jen I would tell the story. Um, and this, particular Sunday, I was preaching on Noah's Ark, and I had a whole regalia um, prepared for the, for the, for the morning. Um, so what I did at first was I, I did a PowerPoint presentation behind me um, where the, the whole congregation could see a depiction of Noah's Ark behind me in PowerPoint. And what it was, was it was just a... Um, a toddler's room with a crib and then the Noah's Ark behind it. So if you've ever been to like a religious person's home, oftentimes in the nursery, there's Noah's Ark up on the walls. Um, and so I just put the, uh, uh, you know, like I made sure that everybody was in the congregation got, got to see what a toddler's uh, nursery would look like. And then secondly, what I did was um, I, I got a smoke machine and uh, I took a rainbow and I shot a rainbow through the smoke down the center of the aisle. Um, Cause you know, there's a rainbow in the story of Noah's Ark and it's, it's God's promise that he's never gonna flood the earth ever again. And I thought that was really important for the story as well. Um, and uh, thirdly, what I did was, um, I'm trying to think in order of how this went. But um, the next thing I did was I handed out um, food for the whole congregation. So what we did was we had um, cubed meat that we had cooked on skewers and we handed it out throughout the entire church and everybody got a little piece of meat. Um, 
And I said, you know, before we go into the story of Noah's Ark, I just want everybody to, as a community, eat a, a skewered piece of meat. And so everybody liked the body of Christ, but instead a, a piece of um, charred meat, ate a little piece of um, meat. And then what I also did was um, I had like ocean sounds, like when you're going to sleep, um, kind of in the background, just a, like a nice lapping ocean playing. Um, I like when you're listening to an ocean and you're trying to fall asleep. And then the, the next thing I did was I, um, let me see, I'm trying to figure the order. Um, I had uh, the sound of a drowning giraffe played over the sound of, a, um, of the ocean. And if you've ever heard the recording of a, of a drowning giraffe, it's, it's abysmal. I mean, it's, it's terrifying. It's, it sounds like, yeah. like it's a lot like that noise. And I just kind of played that to the sounds of a lapping ocean uh, um, on the walls of the ark. And, uh, and, it, and it, what I said was that's the sound of the third giraffe, you know, the, the extra giraffe, like Ralph, the giraffe. Um, and the congregation was starting to get a little, and this is probably my 100th, 115th Sunday at this congregation. And so um, behind me is the depiction of the ark scene with Noah and the sun. And, you know, the, the rain clouds are, are scattering. Um, and then the other thing I did was um, I let the congregation know that the meat that we had eaten was giraffe. That, um, that everybody was, had partaken in giraffe. And that, that was kind of what, what the, the moment was for me and for the audience was um, the depiction of God's first genocide. And I thought that was really important for all of us to kind of partake. And that that's the scene that babies look up into from their cribs in religious churches, in religious um, people's houses. And they're just looking up at the, very first, and then I was kicked out of the church. And I, after that wonderful memory from my life, I would like to introduce my good friend, <laughs> Jen Fitzgerald. I can make the sound of a drowning giraffe one more time. Uh, like, one more <laughs> <laughs> Just on until I come up with this. I think the live stream is there. Okay. Um, so thank you, parents, for setting up my story with uh, genocide, lullabies, and dying drafts. Um, it's very meaningful to me. All of our conversations are very meaningful to me. Um, I think that. Unlike you, I've been cursed as a writer to be what the Irish call the failed conversationalist, meaning it's sometimes hard for me to stay present in the moment enough to engage with someone meaningfully because everything that someone says to me has such meaning that I go within and try to ruminate with it. And I forget to continue engaging in the conversation and I just ruminate and I'm like dumbstruck by the things that people say because there is a tremendous amount of wisdom that happens when two people talk to one another. Um, when Terrence and I talk, I often imagine that if other people were listening, they would think that it was nonsensical because he and I are just able to tap into a space and say a few words and something is transmitted and then something is responded to and then again, transmitted and responded to. And I'm not even sure they're cohesive sentences at the time. Sometimes they might just sound like a drowning draft, but we understand what the other means. Um, so Terence has a way of connecting and communicating with people that is really beautiful and often profound. And because he is so quiet and stoic, I don't always know if he's aware. Well, he is. <laughs> he is, maybe not with you, but I assure you, he has a stoicism that is very charming. Um, I'm not always sure that he understands where he's going and what he connects to in those, those spaces because 
he is able to orchestrate and facilitate things that are far beyond our grasp. Um, tonight is definitely an example of that. Um, when I was trying to think about what I would say, or more importantly, how much I would say, um, I looked back and listened to the past two speakers, the past two storytellers. And I feel like it was no mistake that I came after these two. When I heard um, Andrea's story, I resonated with it deeply. And there were aspects of things that she was tapping, to, tapping into within herself that I saw in myself only a few years ago. She was articulating things that otherwise would be inarticulatable. And when I went back and I listened to Denver's piece, I recognized myself five, six, seven years ago. Um, the thing that connected me to that was the idea of the physical journey, knowing that you have to take yourself somewhere, that you have to get on the road, whether it be literal or metaphorical, and you have to see something new, you have to communicate, you have to exchange with other people, and you have to listen to their stories. And when it came to Andrea's piece, um, I transcended the physical story a little bit. And I remembered what Brian Doyle said, that stories are prayers. And sometimes the greatest prayers that we can say are the ones that we say to ourselves. And that's something that I felt in Andrea's piece was the prayers that she was saying to herself, the way that she was lifting herself up and engaging. And it was deep. And um, as I tried to figure out how much I should say, because there are many aspects of my story that are hard to believe and uh, difficult to communicate. So as I'm saying, like, I know I need to say it. I know I need to finally speak up and let people know what my actual experience is of this world. And I can't because they're gonna think I'm crazy. But at some point we have to step into the wildness that exists within our own mind and be unafraid. And the way that she ended her story is how I'm going to start mine. And it was with the Marion Williamson quote. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. As we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. As soon as I heard that, I was like, well, obviously I have to say everything. And <laughs> have to be unafraid of how crazy it may or may not sound. And, and I imagine that when I am finally willing to be honest that there'll be six or seven other people right away that can be like, yeah, I know, I feel the same way. Same things happen to me, I get it, I understand, I see you. And whether or not that happens tonight or five years from now, that's okay. Because it is now definitely time to start talking. I think starting around the age of eight, I began to understand that the way that I interact with the world and the way that I communicate is very different. Um, I've known things that no eight-year-old should know. Um, I've seen things coming. Uh, I've had premonitions since even before then, much earlier, for as long as I can remember. Um, as things come, to fruition that I've seen in detail, I just stay quiet because even if I had told someone ahead of time the frightening dream that I had had, it would be no solace that that frightening dream had then come true. And when it would get too intense to ignore and I would say like, I, I, like, I saw that, saw that coming, saw that in a dream, people would look at me like, yeah, or whatever, okay, nuts. Um, but as it happened more and more and more, I started to tell people a little bit ahead of time. I'd be like, you know what? I have a feeling this is gonna happen. I have, a, I have a feeling. Just trust me, I have a feeling. And sometimes when a friend would wake me up from a dream, I would give her the details of the dream because I knew it was gonna happen. And 
the few times where I was able to come together, whether it be kismet or the universe being sly, and people would look at me as my dream was unfolding around them and be like, you dreamt this, you dreamt exactly what this, and I'm like, I know, <laughs> I've been telling you guys this for years, it's not easy, but it happens and it's true and I have to listen to it. And beyond the premonitions, um, I've always been received a little differently by people. Um, strange things happen to me constantly, all the time. Sometimes I just stay home to avoid the strange things that are bound to happen. Um, I'm the person who takes the ferry and a young man walks over and just looks at me and he's like, miss, what do you do if you want to end it all right now and just jump off this boat? And I said, well, you sit down for a minute and you put your feet up and you talk to me and you tell me, tell me what's happening. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a therapist, but this is how it's been for me since at least the age of 13, 14, is that people come to me with these tremendous burdens and all of a sudden I know exactly how to handle it. And I'm peaceful and I'm calm and it never makes me anxious, never makes me worried, I just know how to show up for them. I um, was driving to work, actually I was working at a restaurant in South Slope a few years ago and I was dropping my daughter off with my mother. And uh, as I'm crossing an intersection, this woman just blows through the light. And the man in front of me, she clips the back of him and he spins three times. And I have to swerve very intensely to not be hit by her. And as I get out of the car, the woman is in a panic and she nearly killed me and my child. And she's shaking and she runs up to me and she just says, hold me. And I just held her and that's it. Like, okay, I'm here. I could be angry. This, this almost went really, really badly, but yes, you are in pain and you are scared and you are suffering and I will do nothing but hold you for as long as you need me to. And her daughter got out of the other car and, and pulled her mother away. But there was no doubt in my mind that that was the appropriate and proper response in that moment was to hold that woman because she needed to be held. Those are two examples of a very, very long list of instances in my life where I have been asked to rise to the occasion. And I, I didn't know what the occasion was. I just knew how to be of service. And I was raised to be of service in some capacity. I, I come from a law enforcement family. I was taught to give and not take always. Um, leave the world a little bit better than where you found it. Leave the room that you're in a little bit better how you found it. Leave the person that you're with a little bit better than how you found them. And anything that you give to them will be replenished from a source that's deeper than humanity. And it has stood true every time, every single time. So when I try to tell my story, it feels like bits and pieces or bits and starts because the connections that I'm making are arcing above narrative in my experience of them. Um, they take aspects of narrative and almost draw lines instead and show connections. So for me, something like peace is the narrative and then I can show you how it works. Something like love is the narrative and I can show you how it works. As, as my life progressed and I started to feel like I needed to trust myself a little bit more because I, you know, I went full muggle there for a while <laughs> and I, uh, you know, I got married and got a house and uh, tried to be as normal as possible. And, you know, strange things kept occurring. Um, my gifts as a medium started to open up around that time, for sure. I had always had impressions and intuitions, but now I was getting direct guidance. And there had always been you know, a supporting voice in my life, even through childhood, because I had a profoundly abusive childhood. And uh, I think more detrimental than the physical violence was the gaslighting and the attempts to uh, emotionally manipulate, to convince me that things weren't how I had seen them. And as this was being done to me, there was the voice that was much wiser than me, even at the age of six, seven, and eight, that said, no, 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 that's not right. You were there. You remember what happened. You know that she's lying. Look at how she's standing right now. 
memorize her body position because when she comes back to this moment, she's gonna to try to lie again and you're gonna remember where her foot was. And I was given these anchors, these ways to stay sane despite all of the insanity. And I carry that now with me as my experiences of the etheric realm, let's call it that, can start to also feel maddening. I'm given anchor points and given things to hold on to, to return to like breadcrumbs almost. Um, it's, uh, it's no secret that I have been isolating for the past few years, pretty intensely before COVID. Um, the global pandemic was actually somewhat of a relief for the way that my life was going. I was like, oh great, finally things can calm down now for me. The whole world is in turmoil. Um, but I had been isolating because I knew that I was heading towards a new, a different precipice. Um, I knew that the information that had been coming to me over and over again was getting eerily accurate. And it felt like I was the canary in the coal mine. And the few people that I would try to say things to, um, like in 2019, when I was trying to leave the city because I felt what was coming. And I'd say to my mother, just trying to impart this on them, like, mom, you don't understand. I'm seeing flashes, I'm seeing explosions, I'm seeing people in the street, it's violent, it doesn't make sense. Like, we have to go, we have to have a plan. And she's like, oh, geez, come on, enough. <laughs> Lo and behold, explosions in the street. And I was there, I was there for the very first one. I was um, stuck in the protest that turned riot uh, at the end of May in Union Square, I was there taking photographs for um, the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. I had done a few pieces for them, and I was trying to add another layer to it. And I was trapped, like literally trapped, like people coming in from the left. They had barricaded off the right. Police vans were exploding, Molotov cocktails. They had lit every garbage can on fire. And as it went downtown, the, the fires were continuing that way and then the cops began to descend behind me. So I was quite literally trapped and the things that I had seen uh, came true for me. And the few people that I had tried to express these things to even before they began to unfold had later come to me and say, like, oh my God, you were right. And can you please tell me what comes next? And I would, and I would start to explain a little bit about what I saw, um, even as the beginning of this pandemic started to unfold and made it clear to people that it was going to continue to unfold. It was going to continue to intensify. There was never going to be a return to normal, but this was the trigger point that led us into the new. And that doesn't mean that it was going to be safe or easy initially. Uh, most transition requires some sort of turmoil, whether it be inner or outer. And that's what we have been in the thick of. And before I return to myself and my experiences and what I've been going through, I feel like I should share a little bit about what's to come. It's okay with everyone and if they're comfortable with it. Okay. Um, so I saw 2020 into 2021 as the worst year I would ever spend in New York City, which is why I was so desperately trying to flee from it. Um, but I was pulled back because this is where my family is and this is where I belong and this is where I'm anchoring, whatever it is I'm anchoring. 2023, uh, I feel like it's gonna be the worst year on the planet. Um, I think that there's a lot of interpersonal strife that has begun to unfold and is not going to pull back. And unless and until we can raise our own consciousness and let that extend to the way that we approach and help and deal with others, that this energy will continue to spiral. And it will start to play out a little more keenly on a global scale, because the way that we deal with each other is an extension of the way that we deal with the other. And for us, um, seem to be primarily xenophobic in this country, uh, the other can be large masses of people in other countries. Can we, we don't understand them, we don't understand ourselves. So, 2023 is, is going to be rough, but 2024 is going to be an opportunity to, to come together again and to band together. And if we can keep our eyes on that particular prize, how when the dust settles and we realize that we are all we've got, 
the sort of unity that is going to be formed by that, the sort of bond is going to be impenetrable and it's going to allow us to build whatever our idea of the new world is. Because the old world is gone. It is crumbling, for sure. And that's okay, because it, it only served about 2% of the population. So, on to other things. This is the type of stuff where it's like, this is the first time that I've articulated this, you know, to a group. I, I try to, to say it to, to people of intimate relations, but there's almost no way to do that. There's no way to, to communicate these things effectively and to feel safe doing so. So that makes me feel like I, I want to return a little bit to what my personal experiences have been, what my story has been thus far. And it has been constant intersections with the divine, constant intersections with um, other people in my life that require some help. Um, when my uh, gifts started to open up a little more exponentially starting in um, 2016 and 17, I, I took myself on some big time journeys. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know why. I just knew that I had to get in the car and I had to drive. And some of the journeys I was able to take my daughter with me and let her experience what felt like was going to be the last few ounces of freedom that we had in this lifetime, at least for a long time. And being on the road is, it's, you know, other people tell me it's a frightening prospect and that I should be afraid, especially to be a woman driving by myself. But there wasn't a single moment where I was afraid. It wasn't a single moment where I made a left turn and was afraid of what was around the corner. It was only kismet, only synchronicities, only joining with what felt like a higher layer or level of existence. Um, I would meet people that I was very clearly destined to meet and they would in immediately know that they were meant to meet me in those moments. Um, that's not to say that I haven't been a divining rod for chaos and catastrophe because I have. Um, something as simple as trying to take the train home from uh, a writing conference in Seattle and ending up on a five and a half day escapade through, uh, what was it, landslides, um, the train breaking down, having to take a nine hour bus trip, the windshield wipers breaking during the blizzard, um, postponement after postponement after postponement and uh, getting basically what felt like dragged to my death emotionally and just knowing that that was exactly what was supposed to happen to me and have my husband at the time tell me that, you know, if everyone on the train knew this was happening to them because you were on it, they would kill you. They'd burn you. <laughs> and he wasn't wrong. Like, he wasn't wrong. But I don't, also don't know how to articulate that to some weary train riders who uh, want to know why all of this is happening to them. Um, So I think for me, the hardest part right now is how to transition into the current, like what's happening to me in this moment, because um, I've aligned with my purpose completely now. And as I've done that, I've been, I've been taken to places within me that feel very sacred and feel very holy. Um, like I said, I've always been tuned in and tapped into that liminal and numinal space. And I didn't know that it was so special. Um, the first time that I tried psychedelics, I was in my thirties. That was just not anything that I was interested in. And I tried it and I was with someone who was, was very serious about it. Like, like this was part of her process and she, you know, she loved it. She loved the, the peace that it gave her and um, the emotional peace. And she suffered from uh, chronic pain and rheumatoid arthritis and said that the only time that she was not in pain was either when she was on mushrooms or when she was physically near me, her pain would stop. And she's not the only person to have that experience. But that, all that goes to say that when I first took it, um, I understood that what everyone is trying to access is something that I have been privileged to access my entire life. It's a space that I've inhabited. This is something that I share with trauma survivors. Um, 
most people do not understand disassociation <laughs> as you pulling yourself back and going into that same space, that subliminal creative sphere where you are in charge, where it's your dominion. And that space is real, that's the etheric realm. That's where mediums go when they connect with uh, people that have passed on. That's where channelers go. There's different layers, there's hierarchies. Um, part of my isolation and opening up my gifts is that I've actually been given roadmaps to the divine. I've been filling books upon books upon books with hierarchical structures and things that could explain so simply and so candidly exactly what you experience now here in those moments and exactly what happens to you when you pass away, when you cross over. And I know that now is the time for me to start talking about this because I'm being surrounded by such severe trauma and death and pain and suffering and anguish that I would almost have no choice but to finally talk about this, to finally let people know that there is solace immediately. Ram Dass was kind of joking when he said that death is like taking off a tight shoe. But he is 100% correct. It is just like taking off a tight shoe. It's like being released. It's like coming out of a, a, a tight cocoon and just being liberated in that moment and being free. And I know it's weird to say that my story is what it feels like to die and cross over, but I've done it so many times. When you transcend as a medium and when you do this, it is akin to that. It, there were times where I wasn't sure if I was alive. I couldn't prove it to myself that I still existed here because I was so far over there. And when you pass away, when it is finally time for you to cross over, you are met by tremendous light instantly, right away. Sometimes you're met that, by that light before you fully transcend it, which is why you'll often hear people who are about to pass away start talking to deceased loved ones. That happens a lot. They start engaging with people that couldn't be there. And you might think like, oh, they're just, they're losing it. Like they're not well. No, they're very well. Someone has stepped forward to help them because they can see that they're suffering or, or there was a promise that when it's your time to go, if I go first, I'm gonna help you. And those promises um, remain true. They transcend life. When you first pass away, like I said, you're met by tremendous light right away, right away. The fear of the moment that you were in is somewhat abated, and then you are guided more and more outside of the fear. If the passing was instant, then you are instantly on the other side. And it's gonna take you a moment to understand what has happened. But as I said, right away, you're met by uh, voices and energies that feel familiar to you. Some people call them guides. You might have heard the term spirit guide. That's real, that exists. You have more than one. And they meet you over there. There is a liminal space that you inhabit. First, obviously they try to get you to comprehend what has occurred if you don't already understand it. They will comfort you. They will offer you solace and what they call remediation. It starts right away, actually. Um, some people call it a life review. You're shown um, the life that you've just lived. You're shown the choices that you've made. You're shown the people that were meaningful to you. And right away, the only things that you will regret was the time that you did not spend with those that you love across the board. If you ask anyone who has come close to death and has gone or at least begun to go through that liberation and that life review process, that's the only things that, that they will bring back with them is I regret not spending more time with my family. I regret not calling my friends. I regret working as much as I did. I regret not being honest. I regret not following my passions and my dreams. These are all of the things that at a deep soul level you resonate with. The best way to find those things, like the key to them is to seek out happiness. Anything that makes you happy, that brings you joy, that's your path. And the more that you reject it because it's foolish or you have to work, I can't be a painter, I have to work, I have a job. No, you have to be a painter. That's what you came here to do. It doesn't mean that you have to become a destitute painter. <laughs> we can always balance these things, right? There's a difference between um, 
creating a life and making a living, but the two can happen concurrently. Another through line between me on Andrea and Denver is that we are all working class artists. I've got it, thank you. And right away, I recognized the kinship in their story because there is a sort of working class mysticism, whether you're Catholic or not, most of us tend to be Catholic, I don't know. Um, but there's a working class mysticism <laughs> that permeates these cultures and the mechanisms of survival are so tied into that mysticism, whether it be knocking on wood or my purse that's on the table and not on the floor because purse on the floor, money out the door. There's mm -hmm. all of these things that we're trained into. And it's a way for our ancestors, our loved ones to give us wisdom that we're gonna carry with us. And the wisdom is non-physical. It's not you know, how to cut a piece of wood, it's how to make sure you don't curse yourself, <laughs> how to make sure that you are always grateful enough to keep away disaster. They understand at some level that there's a frequency that you can inhabit. They don't know how to say that. They don't know the words. They just say, stay grateful, be happy, work hard, do the right thing, be a good person, right? All of these are ideals. Like, what do you mean be a good person? Everyone in this room has a different idea of what it means to be a good person. But when you say that and you impart it to another person, they're immediately going into their sense of goodness because that's all we have is our own sense of goodness. Now the through line between Denver, Andrea, and I, I think is one of the inner journey, which is another way to completely locate happiness. When you find that place where you feel like you're being a good person, you're serving yourself and others, and you have gaps of time to pursue something that gives you joy, then that means that you are on purpose. And I don't just mean on path, right? Because purpose is path but you are on purpose, that you came here for a reason, that there's a role that you can fulfill, that there's something that you can do here, that you can make an impact. Whether or not it's the very fact that you were willing to dedicate time and effort into pursuing joy, who does that, right? Especially not working class people, we don't do that. Our joy is supposed to be in fulfilling our responsibilities, you know, raising our families, providing, that's our joy. There's a whole other level of joy that exists beyond and outside of that. And tapping into that creates a brand new root system. One that unlike our physical responsibilities that root us into the earth and keep us alive, this thing that you tap into creates a root system into that life, into your family life, into the way that you love, treat and respect others, the way that you show up for yourself and for them. Because when you're feeding that part of you that seeks out and wants joy, you start to feed everyone else because giving to them no longer takes from you. It's just an extension of what you are already tapped into, which is maybe a higher self, maybe, I don't know. But working class people are extremely mystical and claim to be irreligious, but we are, we are very, very mystical folk and a lot of that is our own version of filial piety. It's the way that we pay homage to our ancestors, right? We might have our great grandmother's china and we are always terrified to use it. So it never comes out because if you break it, you can't get it back and everyone's gonna be mad at you because you were trusted with that and it was hers and she's gone, you know how it works. But if you have parables from her, if you have wisdom, if you have allegory, if you have superstitions or even just sayings and you can, repeat those and make that part of your life, it's better than putting the china out on the table because those feed everyone, everyone. Because just like you tapping into your joy, those little bits of wisdom come from the same place and they have the sound of truth. We don't really know how to explain that we know it's true, but we know the difference between wisdom and knowledge and those little things, those little allegories are definitely wisdom beyond the words of it, the tone of the voice that says it, right? When it's the grandmother, when it's someone who loves us imparting it, that wisdom has a tone of truth 
And mm -hmm. we can recognize that tone everywhere. We know it when we hear it and we know it when it's absent, which is why when we listen to politicians, we're, they could be saying the most convincing things and connecting it to you know reality. And you're just like, this is a complete lie. This is, this is like, I don't know why I know, but I just know that that is not the truth because I know the truth when I hear it and that is not it. So that ability to tell truth from lie is probably one of the best survival mechanisms that our ancestors can pass on to us. And speaking as someone who, even though my family has been in this country for so long, we are still immigrants. I don't know if it's because we've been in New York City this whole time. I don't know if it's because my mother was raised by my grandmother and she was raised by her grandmother who was an Irish revolutionary and how she was born here. But whenever she'd get mad at me, a magical grove would come out and I don't know. And sometimes my mother has it too. Uh, I've heard, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, what are you doing? So many times. And like, they were born here. There's a city in Staten Island. It's okay. Uh, So when I tap into those spaces where I'm bringing in information from places that we can't see, that are much closer to that realm of joy and realm of wisdom, the first and only thing that comes through always is love. And in my personal experience, the most powerful expression of that from the other side is a mother. Every time a mother is stepping forward to communicate with her child, it's like, like I, I get dizzy, I have, to, I have to like position myself because what is coming through might be too much even for me to handle in the moment. Because when a mother is reaching out to her child from beyond and needs that child to know how much it is loved and how, how painful it is for the mother to be pulled from her child in that way, the way that she steps forward, it's, it's like all hands on deck. It's like, you need to tell him this and then you need to tell him this and could you touch his neck for me? And can, maybe can you hold him? I know it's not comfortable for you, but I just need to hold him. I just, can you just hold him? Just bring him in. And sometimes I will. And um, in Puerto Rico, I was recently in Puerto Rico and I was there with a friend who was aware of this room, but not fully present in it. And she, I don't, this is the first time that I'm being candid about my gifts. So she did not know. She just knew that I always had some sort of an inner knowing, but she didn't know that I was a medium. And uh, we had this joke that we were waiting to find Carlos and Carlos was gonna be you know, a super attractive young man and we were gonna hang out with him. And like everywhere we went, it was like, where's Carlos? Where's Carlos? Mm -hmm. Uh, and on our last night there, we were in San Juan and we were walking back from the beach and it was dark. And uh, this young man walks past us and she was joking. She's like, are you Carlos? And he's like, yes. And she's like, what are you, you're not Carlos, stop it, stop it. He's like, no, I'm, I'm Carlos. And he pulls out his, his ID and, and you know, I'm, I'm laughing and uh, she's, I don't know, I think she was flirting with him, but I'm just, uh, and in that moment, his mother stepped forward. And I was about to respond. I was about to engage with the flirtation. And I said to myself, okay, I can write this off as whatever. We finally ran into the Carlos and he was very handsome. Um, or I can step up and bring his mother through. And when I tell you that right away, he knew that she was there. He, he felt her. And I asked him, I, you know, I said, if you're comfortable with this, um, your mother is very present and, and I, can, I can bring this through. And I looked at my friend to make sure that she was comfortable with it too, but she was just like, what is happening? Um, and the first thing she wanted me to do was to pull him close. She wanted me to touch his face. She wanted me to put my hand here and just hold that part of him and just let the contact be there. And I had never let someone step into me before. Um, Unfortunately, I had had a bourbon and sometimes mm -hmm. that space is harder to keep. Like when they say that spirits are spirits, it's hundred percent true. Your personal barriers when you drink are lessened and things can speak through you. So in that moment, she was able to step up and I let it happen because I could feel her presence. I could feel the intensity of it. And she just wanted 
for Miho to know how much she loved him and how proud she was of him. How proud. She just kept saying it over and over again. She was so proud. And I let all the information come through. She wanted to speak to him about uh, his brothers and the fight, the issue that he was having, that all of them were having with the one brother and the problematic girlfriend. There's always a problematic girlfriend. Um, and she let me communicate everything. She let, she was, but she was also asking for help. She was asking like to, for me to stay in touch with him, for my friend who was a social worker to facilitate, like she was advocating for him from the other side. And he didn't seem to be suffering. I mean, he was a TV star married to a former Miss Universe. Like I don't think his life is that bad, but the mother saw problems and she wanted them fixed. And she found a medium and a social worker. And she's like, here, you're with him now and you're gonna help my boy. And we did it because when a mother insists that her child needs help, that child will get help. Whether it's here, whether she's going into the doctor's office and saying there's something wrong with my kid and you're gonna fix it and you're gonna find it and we're not leaving until you do. That, that mama bear thing that comes out when she feels that her child's in need, that doesn't go away. That's still, that still comes through especially for mothers, especially, and grandmothers too. The energy is not as powerful with grandmothers, but the love and devotion and anxiety around the suffering of the grandchild is still all there. So you'll be happy to know that mothers still worry from the other side and get to keep that with you. That doesn't go away. Congratulations. Um, the reason that I feel that it is necessary for me to start talking about these things is that when I start to impart wisdom that I've learned about how absolutely important your relationships with other people are, I need people to listen. And if I have to bring evidence, I will. And I'm willing to do that now. I'm willing to, to talk candidly about it. I'm willing to facilitate with people one-on-one -on -one. Um, because we have a lot of healing to do around our interpersonal relationships, a lot. And while I would formally insist that we have to work on ourselves before we can work with others, I think the time for that has passed. And I think that it's, as I said, imperative that we start to heal the rifts that we have created by projecting our fears, doubts, and dreams onto other people. I would say that most of the anguish and turmoil that we have in our interpersonal relationships is because we are projecting fears and doubt onto them or they are doing it to us and we feel helpless under it. These are the primary things that break people apart, especially families, especially working class families who put so much on the next generation, so much pressure often. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of people are going to start to have more visceral experiences of the divine. Um, I use the term divine to say everything that is not here, which is actually a lot. Um, we think that we are so grounded on this, this physical plane and that we're so sure of like how hard and soft things are and how water flows and that, you know, because we know that we, we've got it all figured out. But um, as science catches up with truth, we begin to see that less than 3% of the perceivable universe is the visible light spectrum, right? So 3%, everything that you see, everything in your world, everything that you inhabit is only 3% of what is perceivable. It requires extrasensory, it requires, you know, the ability to conceptualize and abstract, but when you learn that 97% of what you inhabit is invisible to you, it kind of wakes you up a little bit, kind of. You know, kind of turns that, that idea of, I know, I know everything upside down because there is no way that we could know everything here. And when I tell you that, that wisdom is first accessed through the self and then the other, I'm not kidding. Because if everyone that we know and love is still reaching out to us, 
after they've left their body here, that tells you something. How much time do I have? Now, I wasn't allowed to prepare for this outside of listening to uh, the, the videos. I wasn't allowed. Every time I tried to prepare, it was forbidden. Not by Terrence. It was. You know, I was. I was not allowed to prepare. Um, I am being consciously guided to stop thinking that even I know what needs to be said in the moment. Um, I'm being taught and shown to just arrive. And every time I arrive, I quickly realize how and why I was guided to that space. And instead of narrative storytelling being something that has a beginning and middle and an end for me as I go into it, I have to let it unfold. And it usually starts in the middle for me. Um, stories bloom now, they're not constructed, they're realized. So storytelling has become complicated for me, which is okay, because I think that we're, we're developing a new narrative structure. But all this goes to say that um, I hope the story that I told tonight had the through line that I intended it to have. And I hope that I allowed everything that needed to be said to be said. And thank you for listening to probably what sounded insane some of the time. Uh, it means a lot to me that I can let this part of my light come through and to feel safe and secure and on purpose doing it. Thank you.